All right, so what we're going to do today is we're going to pick up some odds and ends, and then we're going to start talking about the games, as I promised. And this is the first third or first part, but I think the most important because it gets you started and everything. I'm probably not going to give you all the information because there's a lot of information here and enough for you to do for two weeks. And if you're like zipping along as you are with the games, just go for it. And we'll just try to wrap all those games up next week, okay? Or next time we meet, which would be after Thanksgiving. So I'm very excited to see that you're getting into this. And that you're, and that's the best way. If you get excited about it and you start going for it yourself, you know, you, you're going to be teaching me here pretty soon. You may be teaching me today. I may just stop just let you finish it up. <laughs> Take it back and... <laughs> yeah, I'm Panera's. I get me a sandwich. That'd be great. <laughs> right, right. I can just sit here and listen to you and, and learn something about Java finally. So right, right here, I just want to start going over a few odds and ends that we haven't picked up. We're going to try to pick up today, and that is what comes up about fonts. Now, with the swing architecture, fonts are a lot easier to handle. But in the old days in Java, they weren't, and you really had to pay attention to how you were handling them. And uh, the one thing I want to give you is the number one over seventy-two. Okay, and this is where a lot of confusion hits uh, when you're working with design people. I typically uh, get, have worked with a lot of designer, graphic designers. And classically trained gla graphic designers, they've gone to college, they've gotten their degrees, they've been trained in graphic design. And mostly they're trained for print. And when you're trained for print, they think of a concept called DPI, which is dots per inch. So they can actually put a lot of dots per inch, as many as they want or as few as they want. But when you get to a computer, you can't do that. Typically you have about 72 dots per inch, okay? And that, that comes in when it comes to when you start talking about fonts, all right? And fonts, so that's where you got the whole point system, you know, 14 points, 12 points. What does that mean? That's actually a pixel out of 72. So if you make something 72 points in, in a font, you've actually made it about an inch high. And so uh, in computers, when you start talking about um, putting graphics on the screen, you really don't think anymore about DPI dots per inch because there's only just so many dots per inch you're going to have on a screen, and that's it. It's not going to change. Now, where that does change is when you change the screen resolution. But if you make it smaller, the pitch, pixel you know, it gets bigger. And if you make it less, it gets smaller. So once again, the point is you get so many pixels for a certain space. You know what I'm saying? That That's how your screen works. And that's not going to change. You can't put more in there than, than the screen allows. And you and if you take less out, it's going to be pixelated. And that's what we try to tell a lot of graphic designers who come in with the DPI concept. It's actually PPI that we think about points per inch. Okay, and the number is 1 over 72 or 72 uh, points or pixels per inch. And uh, so I have this whole write-up, just go on and on and on. But what I wanted to make it is a few, when you look at a word or, or fonts, there's actually what's called this baseline. That's where you kind of just draw the line under the other letters. But, you know, some letters can dip below that baseline. That's called the descent. And there's the ascent. It's all the way to the top. And then you have the width of each letter. And when it comes to fonts, different letters have different widths. So it can be kind of difficult when you're trying to get letters to line up sometimes because they all have varying widths. For example, an I would be smaller than a W. Then the total length plus the letting would be uh, the height of the word. Now, what is a letting? Well, what they used to do is when they uh, actually, in old print days, they put these words, you know, and they separate them. They'd separate the lines with a strip of lead. And so the thinner that lead was, the closer the, you know, the words, the, the lines were together, and the, the, the thicker it was, or the further apart it was, the, the thicker the letting was. So that word comes from old print days, and, and now in Flash uh, 5, you can adjust the, the letting fairly easily. So it's, it's, it's just one of the, as you work with fonts, and people talk about fonts, these are certain concepts that you should be aware of. Okay. So I go, I go on and on, and I shouldn't, but it's just because I, I, I head bump uh, graphic designers on this all the time. So, hey, hey, DPI and PPI are different, and uh, please pay attention. And they were trying to optimize their graphics and, or make them look better by putting more DPI in there. So you can't do that. You can't put more pixels than, than the computer screen will allow. <laughs> so just be aware that concept may come up when you're working with people, and there it is. Uh, I typically, for the web, work with a RGB, and you're going to find a lot of the uh, graphic designers will come along. They're working with something called HSB, which is hue, saturation, and brightness, and you don't really work with that on the web. You're working with RGB with this Roy G. Biv, or red, green, and blue, and uh, each one of those uh, 
particular color is going to have 255 values, and you mix all those together, you get about uh, 16 to 32 mil million colors, depending on what your alpha is. So uh, that's how the colors are generated. And the first program I have here is something called a color chooser, and that's in the code that I sent you. And Bucky does a video on that as well. Okay. So uh, as opposed to me going through this program and going through the color chooser, I have a program there you can play around with, and you can do your own coding. Watch Bucky's video. He does. I think he does an excellent job. And I think his program is better than the one I gave you. Okay, mine is a little bit more complex, but his is, he does it very simply, and I was very happy to see that. So make sure you watch that video there, okay? And let's go down just a little bit more. Just trying to clean up some items that we missed. So the color choosers is pretty nice, and I'm going to show that to you in just one moment. Uh, you're going to start learning about drawing objects, and so you had the question about the donut, right? So first, let me just bring up the color chooser and show you my color, color chooser program. So here's all the code I gave you today. Not a whole lot of pro program. Well, more than I, I thought. I'm going to start sh teaching you about packages today and putting things in packages. Now, you've already come across that, right? And have you been putting things in packages? And you understand what the package is? No, no, no. I'm just joking with you. Here, let me run the color program real quick and just, just a little color chooser here. Bucky's is a little easier, but really all of this stuff right here is actually just the J color component right here. All this is J co color component. You can change the parameters. And what I did is just did a little bit of panel co coding up here using swing so I could actually get this to talk to it. And so I just choose these swatches. You can see I'm changing the colors. Or I could do saturation if I wanted to. Hey, yeah, whoa. Or, you know, move around with saturation. And, uh, or I could yeah, go do RGB. And if I want to do RGB, I could. Yeah, oh, sure. I, absolutely. And Photoshop uses both RGB and uh, hue saturation and, and, and those, those type of things. So uh, that was the color program. Just wanted to show that to you real quick. And I have a bunch of other programs to show you today as well. But um, I'll go back to my notes. And then we're going to get to graphic drawing. And then Bucky actually does way up here in around video 80 something, does, does some graphic drawing. And so we're pretty much done with Bucky. Isn't that amazing, huh? After all this time. He, and then we're going to be getting to advanced stuff that he doesn't, he doesn't handle at all. So, uh, so he's got a graphic one and a graphic two. Make sure you watch those because we're going to talk about using graphics today. You, you, like you mentioned, the uh, donut. We're going to be talking about the donut some today. And I have some other graphics program here as well. Specifically, we'll be seeing visiting this print or this paint and this a graphics G uh, uh, um, mechanism. But once again, Bucky discusses that in his videos. So if we don't get it all, I want you to go back and watch Bucky's videos, okay? All right, and so uh, that's one. And then we're going to move on down here a little bit, talk a little bit about graphics. And then we're going to start the game basic stuff. And since you've already been diving into this, boy, this is going to make my life easy today. Hey, we might get it done early today. All right. But uh, no, we're going to really get into some stuff today. So we've got some stuff to do. And then he starts the basics of animations. And with animations, we need to understand the concept of threads. Okay, so did you get into the threads at all? Okay, so we'll be good, good. So we're going to get that first two. Make sure you hammer that, understand what a thread is, how to create a thread. i got some simple programs to show you. And as you move on down here, uh, we're going to hit the concept of polymorphism. And Bucky does quite a bit of work with that. And uh, he has several videos on that. So if I don't get them all, that's all right. You can watch the videos, right? And where polymorphism has come into play, and specifically for me, and uh, uh, Bucky gives some really simple examples, but it's very powerful. And what I end up doing with polymorphism is I've done a lot of 3D work. And so I can have various primitives, such as a circle or a square or a sphere or, a, you know, just various or, or a cylinder. And I need to do special work on them. So I create a, create a polymorphic uh, method that I can bring each one of those into. Even though they're different objects, I can bring each one of them into because they have the same base class. And I can do work on them and then you know process them even though they are different objects. And that's one of the powers of polymorphism. And he talks about it with using very simple classes. And as we move into 3D, you'll, you, hopefully you'll be able to see the in real action. It's a way of using different classes that have the same base uh, to add to, to manipulate them in more advanced ways. Okay, so it, it really does extend the, the whole concept of inheritance and goes beyond that. Okay. 
And then finally, I just would let you know that we really only have the, the Lecture 7 of MIT to do because we've actually covered all the material. And what we've covered actually is superior to what MIT has done. So you can go back and watch the slides, uh, uh, f I think, f 4, 5, and 6, but it, it pales in comparison to the, the, the concepts that we've, we've handled so far, okay? Which is pretty nice. You've gotten a course better than MIT. Ta-da!